joining us, Tim Wilcox, there. In the last year, the world has become a less peaceful place. That's according to the findings of this year's Global Peace Index, which cites an increase in homicides and violent crime as contributory factors across the world. The index ranks countries in order of peacefulness, and here's how the results from this year's report look. It's good news if you live in New Zealand. At the top for the second year running, Iceland or Japan, also the most peaceful places in the world. But the countries that came out as the least peaceful are Iraq, Somalia and Afghanistan with violent conflict keeping them firmly at the bottom of the list. Well, this year's report has shown up lots of interesting findings. With me to discuss them is Steve Killalay, the very founder of the Global Peace Index. Thanks for joining us. If we could start, Steve, with that broad brush stroke, why is the world a less peaceful place? Well, we found over the four years of the Global Peace Index, the first year it got more peaceful, and the last two years it's actually decreased in peacefulness. And this is corresponded with the downturn in the global economies. And why does it matter? Well, I think the thing with peace, what matters is not so much measuring peace, about what you can learn about peace and what creates peace. So what we've found is that well-functioning governments, uh, societies which have an equitable distribution of resources, and societies which also have strong economies tend to be highly peaceful places. So you think this is something that business leaders should be looking at? Oh, definitely. We've done a study looking over the last four years and the cost of uh, violence to the global economy, and we estimated it at $28 trillion. So on an annualised basis, that's $7 trillion per annum. Now, we'll never get a world which is totally peaceful, but if we could just improve the peacefulness of the world by 25%, that would be $1.7 trillion annually we'd save. That would be enough to fund the Millennium Development Goals. It would be enough to fund the uh, EU's carbon reduction strategy, pay all of Greece's debt and still leave $800 billion over for economic expansion. There are obvious reasons, Steve, you could accuse me of being a uh, member of the New Zealand Tourism <laughs> Board. We've got some wonderful pictures here of New Zealand. The second year in a running, it's come in at number one. Why has New Zealand done so well? Well, if you look at New Zealand, you'll find it's got very low levels of crime, a uh, small number of people in jail, it's got a low expenditure on military and it's not involved in any conflicts. Now, that contrasts with Australia. Now, Australia... Yeah, we can might... hear from your accent that you came in at number 19. I don't want to be competitive, but what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> so, with Australia, the difference between Australia and New Zealand, with Australia being number 19, is that Australia's got a higher expense uh, on uh, the military and it's also involved in more foreign conflicts and basically that's the major difference. That's the huge difference. You've put a huge amount of your own time, your personal fortune mm. into this. Why do you believe it's so important? Oh, look, I think if we look at the 21st century, it's different than any other epoch in human history. The major challenges facing the world today are global in nature, particularly sustainability. Unless we have a world which is basically peaceful, will never be able to solve those problems. Therefore, I see peace as a prerequisite for the survival of society as we know it in the 21st century. Steve, thanks very much for joining us. Thank again. you.